All right. All right. Good Taylor. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, Crooked Spine Show. This is Taylor Fennel. Him and his mom have a practice in Upland. What we talk about is really how do we get people to understand when you're in an accident, how do you prepare yourself for that so your body and your overall mind and the stress level gets to a lower level? It's going to be stressful. That's part of it. But how do you get yourself ready for that so overall you you don't overstress or do the wrong things to make your case or your return going to be less? So Taylor, go ahead and start. So tell me your story, Taylor. How things? How you got into this business and want to come turn and talk about a little bit earlier? Go ahead. Okay, I'll set it up real quick. So. I didn't grow up wanting to be an attorney. Uh, people always think that since my mom's an attorney, I must have wanted to be an attorney since I was a child. Family. But no, my parents actually tried to talk me out of it. But <laughs> when I was in college, I saw the work that my mother did. This was in the middle of the economic recession. People were losing houses left and right. And after working 60 hours a week, she would spend every week in helping families to avoid foreclosure, to avoid losing their houses, and to avoid being stuck in these horrible, horrible contracts. And after seeing that for such a long time, I decided that's what I wanted to do. That's who I wanted to be. With a lot of jobs, you do your job from nine to five and you're done. With attorneys, you do it every single day that you're, every single day of your life, every minute of the day. And I like the fact that attorneys don't stop being attorneys when they go off work. It's a vocation per se. You actually, you're on, like, like what I do, you're on call 24 seven. Absolutely. When people only call you when they have problems, that's sometimes not nine to five. Sometimes not Monday through Friday. So you have to be available to them because they want a, an, at least an insurance, they're doing the right thing right away. Exactly. Why, why is that important? Because sometimes you get a call late at night or early in the morning and you've got to make a decision. And if you make the wrong decision, sometimes at the scene of the accident, sometimes in your doctor's office, sometimes when you're on the phone, you can say one wrong thing that can completely change the, the way your case is going to go. And I think a lot of what you're talking about with your mom's situation to help people with foreclosures, a lot of it is when you do the wrong thing and sign the wrong paperwork, sometimes the best interest of the insurance company or in her sense maybe the mortgage company too back then, it can ruin you for a long time. Absolutely. I've seen so many cases where a person goes to their insurance company and they say, well I've been paying them for a decade, they must be on my side. Well they're looking out for you but they're also <laughs> looking out for themselves. You might be signing a piece of paper that you think is an authorization to receive some documents or a waiver for one thing and it turns out you've just signed away all of your rights regarding your, your case. And it happens every single day, a person will tell you a contract is for one thing, it's actually for something else. And if you sign something without reading it carefully, or more importantly, without having an attorney read over it, you can be signing away your rights. And I think a lot of these people, we're not attorneys, I'm a chiropractor. So something that might be in legal terms may seem okay to me, but like you had mentioned, it may be in their best interest so why not have someone look it over and just and tell, and tell your insurance company, give me a minute, send me the paperwork, at that point let, me, let my attorney look at it. And, and for me, if they go, well, let's just take care of it right now, that's a red flag to me. Absolutely. Anyone who's doing business, if they're not one to let you consult with an attorney, it's because there's something they don't want you to understand or something that they're trying to keep from you. I've had conversations with clients while they've been on hold with their insurance company. Sometimes it only takes a couple of minutes, sometimes it's really easy to address. But it's really important that you have someone who knows what they're doing, look at your documents, look at the information, so you get the right result. And is it good to have an attorney that you have in your, not back pocket, but someone you can go to as a guidance, hey, have a quick question about this and this, may be something accident-wise or real estate or something else, is that good to have and why? It's really important because you never know when an issue is going to come up and you want someone who's accessible, one major major role in our office is that we don't charge for phone calls. We right. always want you to call us, we want you to email us, we want you to feel comfortable coming to us for information. Because we're concerned about the big picture, how your case is resolved. I don't ever want to have a situation where someone doesn't call me because they're afraid I'm going to charge them for a phone call Jeez. and they fail to give me crucial information that's going to affect their case You know, sometime down the line. So I'd rather you call me even if it's on a weekend, even if it's, you know, <laughs> during the day, I'd rather you get the information that you need to make the right decision rather than being afraid to call because you think that you're bothering me or that you're interrupting something. This is my job. You're never bothering me. And, and the, the, the thing is, as a state licensed person, you're liable, I, I'm assuming, as a chiropractors are, for whatever you say or do. So realize the state at some point protects you from chiropractors, from attorneys, from whatever it might be. So, our sense is 
how do you get the right advice from someone you trust with a little question here and there and they'll and over time build that credibility with your attorney maybe Taylor or somebody else so you get a sense of how 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 not only how competent they are but how much do they help you short term and long term because we all have situations in our lives we all do where something small may come up mm-hmm. and if i have someone i can go to hey look quick question he answers right away done that anxiety that stress the what if goes away but when something big happens like you'd mentioned sometimes it's not not nine to five it's not during normal business hours how do you get that anxiety to go away at least having an answer or hey let me get back to you let me give you back on that okay why is that important so when you if you've been injured in an accident you're under a lot of stress there's two sides of it there's the physical side of just trying to get better and there's the financial side when you're hurt and you can't go to work it affects you when you're hurt and you can't, you just can't do the normal things you do in everyday life that affects you. And you don't want your energy and your time to be consumed with the financial side, with being on the phone with your insurance company all day long, with having to write letters to every single doctor you're treated with to get your medical records. You don't want to have to learn how to read an MRI, learn how to read an x-ray. You can't. Because Sorry. that takes so much time, energy, and stress. The best thing to do is let someone who's a professional deal with that side of it. You focus on getting better, getting healthy, spending time with your kids, spending time just being yourself and living your life. And that way, you, you know that someone who's, who's done it for years, who's confident in it, is dealing with the insurance company, dealing with your doctors. And if you have a question about what's going on, make sure they're keeping you in the loop. Don't let someone t- say, I'm handling your case and don't talk to them for a year. No. We call people every month or every 60 days to say, hey, here's the status, here's what's going on. If your attorney's not calling you regularly, you should be concerned about that. You should know every detail of your case. You should know what's going on, where you are, where you are along the progress of resolving, and have some idea of, you know, are we six months away from finishing? Are we a year away from finishing? You should have a timeline. You should have some understanding of what's going on in your case. I think a lot of it is when you're on a case. I had someone recently who went to a, a big company that had a billboard out, and she sort of read the billboard and saw it. Sometimes those big companies are more into having a paralegal or someone someone that may not be on your case all the time and even then you may go to a doctor or or a physical therapist or get an MRI done and it may not seem right to you you have to be able to go hey look this doesn't seem right to me what do you think and having a relationship before you even need an attorney for an accident case I think is important because you can go to them okay look I trust you Taylor at that point is this someone you want me to go to I don't feel right here do you have someone else in line I, would, I had someone, the reason I say that, I had someone, uh, she went to someone for about 10 times in about three months, and actually the, the, the chiropractor made her worse. So my concern is that now she's had about two months of care, her overall case and her husband too, has been diminished because now she has to get more care on top of that to fix the problems that happened in the first place. Yeah. So if you're a person who's injured in an accident, you're dealing with that one case, that one claim, that's one injury. I'm dealing with a hundred injuries, a hundred claims, a hundred doctors, a hundred... I'm looking at the, a bigger picture of things. So if you're telling me your, your doctor is doing something I've never heard of before, I'll let you know, hey, this isn't really normal. This is what I'm hearing from other people. I might even call another car on the phone and say, hey, here's what my client's dealing with. Is this normal to you? I'll get a second opinion for you. And if what that person's doing isn't right, I'll send you to Dr. Tony instead so you get better treatment. Hint, hint. <laughs> one of the biggest things is too with accident cases that I've seen from, from the doctor's side is the longer you wait for care, get the wrong care, the more you build up scar tissue, the longer it takes to get fixed. In the same sense, the longer you, you take to make the phone call to see an attorney, to see a doctor, if that's what you want to do, the longer your body takes time to heal. It's like after a surgery. If you don't do physical therapy right away and start moving the joints, moving the bones, you build that glue, that scar tissue, so you want to take care of things right away. But again, prep yourself by going through the process of finding someone before you need an attorney or a chiropractor for an accident so you know what to say, you know what to do. So go again, let's, let's go over, let's take a step back. How do you prep yourself to be ready to find someone? What are key things to ask an attorney if you're not in Upland to talk to Taylor about how do I find someone that's credible and in my sense on my side if and when I'm in an accident? takes a while, so give yourself a second to think about it, right. Taylor. So, <laughs> so you're asking, what are you, what are you looking for in your attorney? What exactly. qualities what, do they have? What qualities do they have to where, mm-hmm. if, I, if I'm playing, okay, I live in an area, I have a car, my family has cars, I have two or three, I have four kids as far as I know. At that point, they may be an accident or someone I know in an accident. Who do I know that I can trust? How do you build a relationship now? What should, what should I ask that attorney? Okay. 
things you want to know is when you call their office, how many people do you have to speak to before you get the attorney? Do you get to speak to a receptionist and they say, oh, the attorney, you know, they only speak to clients at a certain pay level or a certain, you know, case size. Do they have or to have the case first. Per exactly. Se. Okay. If you call my office, you get to talk to me. Wow. Okay. The other things might be go on their website. Is personal injury law the first thing they mention or is it the 17th thing they mention? If it's number 17 on the list, it's not what they focus on. It's not their specialty. You need someone who specializes, specializes in this because the law changes all the time. There are always new cases that are going to define how your case is going to go. So it's important to have someone who's up to date on the newest laws for personal injury. You wanna know how experienced they are. Have they been doing it for six months or have they been doing it for 16 years? I know I look young, but trust me, I've been doing this for five years. He works out a lot, he's healthy, that's the problem. Thank you very much. So you want someone who's experienced in this area of law because you wanna make sure that they are competent and that they're ready to go. Another major issue is you ask about litigation. There are a lot of attorneys who do pre-litigation work, which means that they might negotiate for you, they might talk to your insurance company, talk to your doctors, but if it's necessary for you to go to trial, a lot of attorneys will not go to trial. If your case is complicated or if you have a big case, you might want to know down the line, is this attorney going to go to bat for you? Because if they're not willing to go to, go to trial for you, they're going to be looking for an easier way out. You exactly. need someone who's going to be in it for the long haul. In the sense, easy way out would mean what? It would mean, let's say, if your case could settle or it can or you can go to trial. Okay. And if you can get a better result a better overall result by going to trial, but an attorney who's afraid to go to trial or who doesn't have trial experience, that's a situation where even if the better idea the objectively better move is to go on and go to trial, if they're hesitant about that, they might settle, they might get you a worse result exactly. because they're afraid to go to trial. It's one thing well here's the thing. Clients make those decisions. Clients decide whether or not to settle their the cases. The final decision. They make the final decision. I will make my recommendation. I will tell you if, if trial is a good or a bad idea, but it's ultimately the client's decision of over, over whether or not to take a settlement. Now, if you have an attorney who does not like to trials, who doesn't do trials, they're always going to tell you that trial is a bad idea. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. If the only tool you have is pre-litigation, trial always seems like a bad idea. For me, I can tell you that 95% of cases settle and trial is often not necessary, but if we're in a situation where we need to go to trial, that's what we're going to do. You, you get your ducks in a row, you line up all your paperwork, and you have to go to trial sometimes. What I think a lot of it is, and, I mean, and, and forgive me if I'm wrong, do insurance companies know, because I'm assuming the car act you're going to basically sometimes fight the insurance company, do they know how often this attorney has gone to trial? Oh, absolutely. Oh, they know. With, okay, good. There are only a handful of auto insurance companies out there. Exactly. You see the same people, you, you make the same <laughs> phone calls over it's and over again. It's public record, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the cases that you try or the cases that you settle, they're in public record every time you file a case. If you go on to the county court website, you can, you, know, you can search the attorney's name, see how experienced they are, how many times they've gone to trial, how many cases they've filed. When I call, let's say, a big insurance company, State Farm, Allstate, places like that, I call the same adjusters all the time. I talk to the same people, yeah. so if you're a straight shooter, if you're an honest guy, if you're a good person to work with, they get a sense of that. And maybe the first call you make with them, they're really hard on you. And they, you they're know, testing they, you, right? They go, how, how strong is this guy? Absolutely. That's your job. But five years later, they know who they can trust and who they can. And they're in, it's the same for me. There are certain people at companies, not, I won't say anything bad about the whole company because yeah. they employ tens of thousands of people and every insurance company has great employees or everyone has not so great employees. But there are certain adjusters that if I get their if I get their number on the case, I'll say, take me off, change it to another adjuster. Done. Because I know that they I know that they either they don't they give up bad settlements or they're not fair negotiators. And after dealing with the same people over and over and over again, I say, you know what, there are certain people, we just can't work with them. Well one thing is when you're in school as as we all were, you get the knowledge and that's part of what you have to get your past your boards, get your license as a chiropractor, as an attorney. Once you come out of school, you get gain the experience over a period of months and years to understand that, to understand who do I want to work with, what human nature is going to be good on my side for my client. At that point, let me get that person because I know who they are. Yes. You have the experience with these other adjusted insurance companies to understand, hey, who do I want to work with and who is going to be my client's best interest? Exactly. How do I make it a fair settlement for them, not only for their auto insurance uh, responsibilities with their car maybe, but also their overall medical care to get back to 100%, both in their overall life and also in their vehicle. Exactly. Does that kind of give you the big picture? Yeah. And that's the thing, as, 
as a person who's had a couple accidents in my past, way past, and kids who've had problems too with their vehicles, a lot of it is what I see is from a chiropractic perspective is having the right attorney on your side, even before you need an attorney, allows you to go, these are my steps I want to take. I trust this person, deal with my case. I deal from the other side where sometimes I get a patient that has an attorney or may not have an attorney and now dealing with an insurance company directly, they're trying to lowball. I, I had one mom call me because her daughter was in an accident because there where she lived, they gave her a minimal settlement, enough maybe to for a good dinner out. Oh, and wow. they said that, they said, that because of where you live, that's what they said, we're willing to offer you this for your case. And that, and realize when they do that, they call someone, they have no medical records, they have very minimal, maybe maybe their auto damage, that's it. So they haven't requested anything from me of what their, what their physical damages are. All right, so that upsets me when someone gets that. I'm glad the mom's upset too, because realize they're there to go sometimes, hey look, there's what we offer you based on what we think is right. They don't know, they don't have all the, all the cards, all the information. So how can they give you a fair settlement if that's what they want to do to make sure your medical bills are paid, short term, long term, you back your 100%. So even when we close your case, and I'm assuming too, Taylor, from your side also, from the medical side, you stay 100%. I don't have to see you for the same injuries two, three months later. And that's my concern because I have people come in here to my office and they had injuries from accident a year ago, the case is settled, and now the same injuries are coming back to haunt them. So I want to make sure on my end, doing with Taylor, that everything's taken care of up front. This is what I need now, and maybe in the near future, so they get 100% and they stay that way. It's someone like Taylor who's done the litigation, who's done the other end, and, and need to sometimes um, push, push the insurance company around. We'll go, okay, I will offer that. We'll, we'll get that thing taken care of. So like you had mentioned, sometimes they're hard just to reach. You mentioned the idea of the amount of information you have about your own case or when you have to make a claim. Of course. As an attorney, I'm looking at, when I go through your medical records, I'm going through with, with a fine tooth comb. And when I ask you about how your life has been affected, I ask about, not just, some people will just say, are you hurt or where does it hurt? Exactly. I say, well, how has this affect your, affected your life? If you have kids, can you still play catch with your kids? If you have a dog, can you still walk your dog? If you like to go to the gym or play soccer, do you still get to be active? And every single way that your life has been affected for the worse, we're going to make sure that we're getting you compensated for that. And the worst thing that I see is when you have two people who are injured in the same accident. So let's say you're, how you're sitting next to me right here. Exactly. If we're in a car, if I'm driving the car and you're my passenger, if we're in the same accident, we're probably going to have similar injuries. Yes. If I hire an attorney and you don't, I get a better settlement for my claim. Even yes. though we're in the same accident, the same injuries, the same day, the same weather, the same car. We should be getting the same settlement. We should in the same way. But at the end of the day, when you have an attorney, they're more thorough. They've done it a hundred times. So they know what to look for. They know how to get the best compensation. For me, you know, when I'm dealing with my hundredth case versus him dealing with his first case, it's not going to be, you just don't have as much information. But when you have someone who's done it for years and they know what they're talking about, they have relationship with the people who they have to negotiate with. They have a reputation with the insurance companies for not taking low settlements, they can get something much better. And I'm not talking about 15% difference, 20% difference. No. I've literally seen people get five times more because they are represented. And realize they know, it's just gotta knows that too, they know your, your rep, reputation as an attorney and you're gonna fight for that client. Person over here, Joe, Joe Schmo, he's going like, well, I'll just figure it out myself. They go, great, fantastic, oh, they love that. They love it when you're representing yourself. Look, these insurance companies are not small. They're not mom and pops, these are multi, billion dollar corporations. Do you think they don't have lawyers on their side? No. They have entire legal teams. I've been to their offices. They have multiple floors of attorneys making sure you get the lowest settlement possible. They love it when you're not represented. They love it when you're on your own. Because it's a billion dollar corporation, dozens of attorneys against just you. And realize you're paying your premium every month no matter what, what happens. They're taking your money either way. What is a situation, if it might be rare, where someone should may represent themselves. Is there a situation like that? Is that, is that something that, because some people think about that, some people I want to get myself, I heard this happens, blah, blah, blah. How does that work? If, you're, if your claim is so small That's, that there's not really any room for them to negotiate. What's a small claim out of curiosity? Just a Let's say if, if you get hurt and you don't need, you don't really need any medical care. Got it. So the only, you only had to go home that night, maybe put some ice on your back and take a day off of work. So the only thing you're making a claim for is the damage to your vehicle and the time you're off of work. 
because if you miss work and you, you can show them a pay stub and say, this is the day that I was gone, there's a dollar value on it, they can't negotiate with that because they know exactly what the dollar value is of one missed day of work. Once you go in for more medical treatment and you have pain and suffering, that's when you need an attorney because it's a lot harder to put a dollar value on pain and suffering than it is to put a dollar value on the bumper of a car on one day of missed work. Subjective versus objective. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Yes. So if all of your damage is, is objective where you can show them a receipt, you know, that's the time when you, you, you probably won't need an attorney. Got it. Is there a dollar amount a, a value of that? A dollar value? Is there something like that or is that just hearsay? Or? I, at a, at a lot of firms there are. Okay. I've heard certain law firms say if it's under 5,000, you know, do it yourself. It's under 7,000 or whatever. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that route, and the reason for it is, if I, if I were to tell someone, if your case is worth less than $5,000, you don't need an attorney, well, how do they know the case is worth less than $5,000? Yeah, that's a big amount for me. Yeah. That's a big amount for me. Because some people who think they have a $5,000 case, you might have a $1,000 case, yes. or you might have a $20,000 case, and you don't know it. I would say it's worth it to call an attorney, explain the situation, and you know, if they tell you, hey, you've got a really small case, it's, it's easy enough, you can take care of it yourself, then go ahead and do it. If they tell you, you know, this is actually a lot more complicated, maybe you're gonna need some help, then you'll know. And that's what I like about having, and which, which I was misinformed, I thought there was a dollar amount, which most, most people think, say 2,000, 5,000, but having, like going back to the variables of having objective variables, this is the cost of the bumper and getting it fixed, this is the cost of my one day off of work, and that's it, I'm yeah. good, okay? Yeah. And also too, like going back to it, once you find an attorney in your area that you like and you can talk to, I would I would no problem calling Taylor and go, hey, look, I had a quick thunderbender in my in my in my uh, in the parking lot at the grocery store. Should I do anything about it? That would make my sense. Okay, I'm going to file a claim for the auto, but also overall, I don't want to cause any other issues. So Taylor will help me figure out. Okay, is it worth it or not to hire an attorney, file the claim? What should I do? You know, that's that's my thing is having that mm -hmm. trust with someone built up so before you have an accident, you actually know what to do. Yeah, and it's it's no trouble for us to take a five minute Easy. phone call and discuss you know how big it's going to be if you need an attorney or not. And if you're, especially if you're already a client of mine, we, we have a good relationship. Sometimes I'll just call you to see how you're doing. You know, if, if we dealt with the case a couple years ago, you know, how's your recovery two years later? You know, if there's something that, if there's something we could have done better, if there's something we could have done worse, how is your medical treatment? Would you recommend that that physician? Would you rec recommend that chiropractor to someone else? Because you know we work in Upland, Rancho, Claremont, San Bernardino. Yeah. We see the same faces. You deal with the same problems. So if someone said their treatment was great right after the case was over, but then two years later those problems come back, it lets me know. Okay, is it something that that the doctor did, or something the chiropractor did, or is it just something inherent in the injury? Where there's certain type right. of injuries that are going to linger, which means the next time I deal with that case. I'm gonna tell them, hey, here's the pain they're in right now, but a year from now, two years from now, they're gonna need treatment again, so when we settle your case, we're getting money for the medical bills you've already had, and we're thinking ahead to the medical bills you're gonna need in the future. And that, I like that because what's the chance of someone who's been in an accident into another accident? Is there, is there a ratio on that? Depending on your age, it's yeah. pretty much inevitable. Okay. One out of 12 people get into an accident every single year. One out of 12 people? Yes. How about a follow-up accident from that one out of 12? Within yeah. five years, something like Within that. five years, about 50-50 chance. Wow. Okay. And that's why I've heard that before. It's 50-50 chance. And what I like about that is you're actually getting some good advice, so it gives you peace of mind. Hey, what should I do next? Yes. I like that. Going back, we talked about before at my office when we first met and chatted, what are the steps you want someone to take? when they're in an accident? What's, what kind of things do you want them to do? You had given me the card with the actual checklist in the back. Let's go through that real quick. Oh, sure thing. Let's do so, it So, when, when a person's in an accident, you don't know if you're gonna file a claim or, or not. You're on the street, you pull over to the side, and you don't know if this is going to be a fender bender, you get their insurance information, you drive away, no you park yourself ways, or what happens when you go home, you, feel, you think you're fine, you wake up the next day, you wake up two days late, and you can't even get out of bed because you're in so much pain. So you have to start with the mentality that this might be a claim later on and start gathering as much information as you can while you're there. So the first thing you're going to do is get their insurance information and get their license information. After a claim, everyone gets their, their registration or their insurance info, but most people do not get their license. You need their license information 
because if you have to file a lawsuit later on, you don't file a lawsuit with your insurance company. You file it against that individual, so you need their name and their address in order to file that claim. So take a step back, though. So just a checklist. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you have an accident, you want to make sure exchange information of, your, of the per, driver's personal ID. So yes. make sure their license is correct and their address is correct, too, and if possible their phone number. Make sure that's correct. Yes. Along with the registration of, or the auto insurance company that they're registered with. Exactly. Okay. Okay, step one. Okay. Number two, get the contact information of witnesses. Oh, okay. How many times do you hear, I was in an accident, <laughs> yeah. I was on the corner of Foothill and Vineyard, Crowd yeah. Street, I was in the parking lot of Victoria Gardens. There's probably 100 people around who see Watching. it. Watching. And then I say, okay, well, who saw it? What's their email? What's their phone number? Oh, I didn't get anybody's phone number. If there are witnesses, yeah. you're going to want their contact information. This is really important because if there's no witnesses who can make a statement, it's he said, she said. Exactly. You're going to say, you know, that you they rear-ended you. They're going to say that you slammed on your brakes and it's your fault. And if there's no one who saw the accident, it's hard to prove. But what's worse than that is if a dozen people saw the accident, it's easy to prove. Just get their information. Make it easy on yourself. Get the information of people who saw the accident. Buy them an ice cream or something. Yeah. And give them a Starbucks gift card or something yeah. like that. It's not bribery, just information. Right. And the next thing is... That's step two. That's Make step sure two. Witnesses. Guys. Step two is witnesses. Step three photographs okay so oh, this, okay. this is another one where people they do half the right thing okay. everyone takes photos of their car after an accident because they want to say well this would happen to my car I got to show my insurance companies how bad it is but you forget to get the photos of the other car they forget <laughs> to get photos of how the street is that? Yeah. oh every, all the time but here's, <laughs> here's what happens we talk about you know when you work with a family you have a long-term relationship yes a lot of times a person's first accident with me, they only have photos of their car. That just, they just don't know. They're they not don't even, know. Their name. And I explain this to them. No. And then two or, th two or three years later, their son or daughter has an accident. And they come in with photos of their car, the other car, train the street that they're on, photos of the people in the other car. And why is it important to get photos of the people? Is because let's say you cause the, let's say you cause the accident. It's your fault. Yes. You rear someone who's alone in their car. And then you get a claim later on saying you hit this guy and his wife and his two kids were in the back seat. And the cousin and the brother-in-law and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and you say, wait a minute, there was no one else in the car. There was just one person. It happens, people. I, I Trust me, it does happen. This is L.A. Yeah. It's still greater L.A. area. Yes, so you have the situation yeah. where they're saying there's four people in the car. <laughs> You're saying there's one person in the car. They all went to the doctor. They're all getting they're racking up these huge medical bills. And you go, wait a minute, there was no one else there. But you can't prove it. So step three is pictures of your car their car and the people in the car would that be on the police report too who's on who's in the vehicle how many people yes if there okay. is a police report that's that's my next thing Go, going taking a step from taking a, a break from step three how often does a police report actually happen if people are injured on the scene there will almost always be a police report okay what's injured mean well injured means that you know at the time of the accident that you're hurt okay so either the cars are damaged so bad that they're not drivable you've got to call the ambulance out but a lot of accidents aren't that bad where you That's don't call an thing. ambulance. Yeah. So if if one of the cars is totaled and it can't drive from the scene, the, the ambulance will come out, the police will come out. If the cars are both drivable, most people, they'll pull off to the side, they'll get their insurance information, and they'll go their separate ways. Well, sometimes you even call the police department and go, hey, look, I was an accident. Well, they, they'll ask you how bad it Oh, was. yeah, they'll say, yeah, well, can you walk? Can you still <laughs> drive? Okay, then drive home. You're good. It's, it's, it's rush hour traffic. We're not getting a cop there for another three years. Oh, exactly. At that point, we're yeah. not. So yeah, if, if you don't know that you're hurt on the scene, usually they'll just tell you to get the information and keep going. Okay. So probably less than less than maybe 20% of accidents end up with a traffic collision report. Well, so less than only 80% actually walk away with no those report from, from a police officer or an ambulance report, something like that. Exactly. Okay. And especially if you're in a, you know, a kind of remote location, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're in downtown LA or downtown San Bernardino, there's going to be a police officer on the corner just nearby. On it's the easy freeway, to something like that. Too. Now, if you're in the further parts of the county, you're out yeah. in Barstow, you're out in the high desert. It's called the sticks. Yeah. If, if a cop's an hour away, you're not going to wait on the side of the street for an hour waiting for somebody. You're going to drive home. When your car can be dri drivable. Exactly. Okay. Going to step four, after you've taken the pictures or have police report or both of the people of both vehicles, what's step four? The next step is it's just about what you say and what you don't say okay. on, on the scene. Okay. So a lot of times people have, you have a reflex. If you're 
if someone is hurt, you say, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry that I did this. I'm so sorry that you're Human hurt. nature. It's human nature. Hopefully, if you're, if you're a good yeah, person, if you're, a, good, if you're a sympathetic person, it's your nature. Humans are humans. And I would say, it's okay to say that you're sorry that a person is hurt. But the, the, there's a difference between saying, I'm sorry that you are hurt, and I'm sorry that I caused you to be hurt. Fault. Admitting fault is never a good idea. The reason for that is, you don't always know that you're at fault. Just like you might think you might think you're okay at the accident, and then tomorrow morning realize that you're hurt. You might think you caused an accident at the scene, and then find out when you're dealing with your insurance company that they are actually committing fraud, oh. and that they've falsely caused dozens of accidents over the state of California over over several years. Wow. You might think that it's your fault, and find out that the other driver was drunk or on their cell phone and caused the accident. So don't admit fault because you don't know that you're at fault. You don't know you're at fault until there's been an investigation, until we've looked at all the evidence and have, and have been able to see, you know, what was really the cause of the accident. So you don't have enough information at that point to admit no. fault or even know what, what happened from your one point, person point of view. Plus, mm -hmm. from my side, you've had a concussion. You're, you have adrenaline going through your body. You're in shock. Your perception of what's going on is not going to be its reality. Exactly. So you have to take a step back. Like you mentioned, sometimes what the next thing go, I had a huge headache. What happened yesterday? Mm -hmm. I talked to a, a Dr. Gallagher out of Arizona. He's a uh, personal injury um, chiropractic expert. He says a lot of people have concussions, they lose their memory short term. So sometimes you may not even remember what happened the next day to a T to the details that you, that you think you, that happened. Yeah. So having that witness, like you mentioned before too, in, in step uh, two, I think, is having that third perspective of what actually happened, that objective perspective of what happened. Yeah. Which helped you a lot. Witnesses can make all the difference. When the police show up to file a police report, they can only look at what's in front of them. They weren't there, they didn't see the thing. They can look at what happened. I actually was just dealing with a case where it, it appeared to be a rear end accident. Okay. And a rear ender, you 99% of the time, it's the fault of the person in back. Because you can't cause an accident when you're driving forward. Unless and you, you go reverse, behind. but that's yeah. not gonna happen. It's funny that you had mentioned that. The person in the the person who was in the accident in the front car, they they said, I got rear ended, it's 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 rush hour, so it's stop and go traffic. Yeah. And this guy in this Porsche behind me rear ended me. Okay. And that's what we told them. That's what the cops wrote down. And an objective witness, someone who didn't know where the party said that's not what happened. They said that the guy in front, he was in a pickup truck, he looked at his rear view mirror, he saw that expensive expensive Porsche behind him put the truck in reverse and backed into it so that he could claim he was rear ended. Oh my god! And you would say, oh, that doesn't happen. It happens every single day. Wow. It happens every day. So that's actually, not only is it a, a, a misperception of what happened, but also it's fraud and a criminal offense. Exactly. Wow. But if you're the guy in the Porsche, and when, when they're telling you, yeah, you, you bumped into this guy, it makes you second guess yourself. Like, wait a second. Because you go, wait a minute, well, you know, we are in stop and go traffic, you're kind of watching the road, but you're also looking, you're fiddling with the radio, yeah. you're doing other things. Did I bump into this guy? Did I accidentally put my foot on the gas instead of the brake? What happened? And your memory is not perfect. But there was a witness who, he saw it coming too. Guardian he angel. To, he was able to recognize, oh, this guy's about to pull something fishy. And he just <laughs> watched him back straight into that car. Oh my you know, god! He saw that expensive Porsche logo when he saw a paycheck. Yeah, yeah. And, and someone who's in a, in a Porsche, not to say they're a personality, I know where you judge, they may go, you know what, I'm going to take care of it, get it done, get it off my shoulders. Yeah. You know, but that, that's amazing someone would actually do that. I've seen it on chips, I think, before, but that's about it. Yeah. It's amazing. And part of my job as an attorney is not just to get the absolute best result for the person who comes into my office, my job is to find out the truth. That's your legal... My responsibility. So when a person comes in and says, I got, I got rear-ended on the freeway or on the street, not only am I doing research to help you to prove up your claim, I'm also going to say, okay, well, you know, had this person filed lawsuits in the past. And if it turns out that you filed a dozen lawsuits in the last year that are all kind of suspicious rear end accidents, that are all low speed, that are all the it's same Not very common. Rare. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I have reason to believe that your accident was not, your, was not actually this person's fault, that you might be trying to commit fraud, and I will take no part in this fraud claim. And so you're then, not going to take every case that comes in your front no. door? If there's a case that is, that's suspicious, if okay. I think, if the person, if the person has a reputation for committing fraud, if they have a lot of suspicious losses out there, I will reject the case in a heartbeat. Why? I know why, but they don't, may not know why. Because I have a legal and ethical responsibility, 
And if you want to commit fraud and go to jail, that's your decision. But I will not be a pawn in your scheme. I will not have you jeopardize my livelihood and my legal license because you're trying to make a quick buck. It's your reputation. Yes. And once you once you once that's tarnished, maybe a chiropractic attorney, a medical doctor, anybody, it's tarnished. And once yeah. the insurance company knows that, they will I'm assuming they'll they'll know that too, that that's when they come after you also. And once one insurance company knows it, they all know it. It's amazing how, how much uh, the uh, the fire spread so quickly. Yeah. And if I have if I help someone commit fraud on one case, that doesn't affect one case. That affects every single case. That affects hundreds of people. Wow. Because it shows that I'm no longer an honest person, and it starts to invalidate everything I do and everything I say, and I can't take that risk. No. You're going to be in this for way too long to help serve people. Why? It's not worth it for one case. Not at all. No. And we step four again. Let's go through step four one more time. Mm-hmm. What was step oh. four? Step four is not admitting fault at the Good. scene of the accident. So we've done that. What's step five? So there, there's not a step five on know, the checklist. I'm going to go like ten. I'm yeah. going to go ten. There's checklists. no step five on the checklist, but there's something that I always recommend for people, okay. which is seek medical treatment as soon as you feel pain. Got it. Because it's once again, you'd be surprised how many how many times you just have bad luck and where things happen. Let's say you get into an accident on Monday. You could have been a safe driver for your entire life. Yes. Drive, driven safe for 20 years, and you get into an accident on Monday, and you think you're fine. You're like, oh, you know, I'm a little bit sore, a little banged a up, kink. but you'll walk it off. Yeah. You don't go for any medical treatment, and then a week later, you get into another accident. Or let's say after the first accident, you start feeling pain on Tuesday, let's say. Next day. And you don't know how bad it is. You don't go to the doctor, and then on Wednesday, you get into another accident. When you get hurt, you're going to try to file a claim against the first guy, and they'll have no way of proving that that accident happened. They oh. won't know which pain is caused by accident one, which pain is caused by accident two. Mm, okay. Or let's say even worse. Let's say you get you get into a car accident. You're in a lot of pain, and you're 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 hurting. You're aching, but you say I'm a tough guy or I'm a tough woman. I'm not going to go to the doctor. I can I can handle this myself. Yeah. And then a month later, you slip and fall down the stairs at your house. And when you try to follow your claim, they're not going to know which pain is caused by the accident which pain is caused by falling down the stairs at your house. No. They might think that it's fraudulent, they might think that you're trying to exaggerate your injuries, and what they're going to say to me as your attorney, they're gonna say, well, if your person was so hurt, why didn't they go to a doctor? Mm. If they didn't go to their doctor, if they didn't go to the chiropractor, it means that they probably weren't that, they weren't that bad off. It's too subjective. Exactly. Okay. Wow. And so you also have to make sure if you're gonna, if something does happen, because we can't predict the future, I can't predict an hour from now if I'm in an accident, I have to make sure I get some tough documentation saying, hey, even though I'm not hurt really bad, I know where I am right now. Let me see a doctor, get a consultation, or even a talk to an attorney to make sure something's documented on paper when this happened. Yeah. I wow. mean, you know, yeah. you're, you're a chiropractor. If you really wanted to, you could, let's say you could treat yourself. If you, you got into an accident, you got hurt, and you wanted to treat yourself. I have a partner, too, so. Or, or your easy. partner. Yeah. yeah. Let's say you, he treats himself, or his partner treats him, and he doesn't document it. And then six months later, he files a claim. They're going to say, okay, well, you got into this accident and you were hurt. Let's let's show, let's see the documentation. Exactly. Show me the proof that you were hurt. And you would say, well, I was, I, it hurt so bad, my back and my neck and this and that. They're going to say, well, that's nice. Do you have? Let's see your medical records. Let's no. see your X-rays. You don't have any. Well, if you don't have any records of visiting a doctor, you don't have any records of treatment. Maybe you weren't really hurt. Maybe you're making this up. And and that's I mean legally, basically, even though it's in my sense sometimes unethical. They can actually do that and go, we're not going to pay you a dime. Exactly. There's, there's no reason to. You, you had time off work. Yes, we understand that. We understand you weren't able to work and take care of your kids. You had to have someone, you had to pay someone to do that for you. But legally, we're not bound to because you have nothing to back up what you felt. Because again, what we feel is our perception. We want to have an objective finding what's going on too. Yeah. That's the key. Hey, you could, you could break your leg and have a bone sticking out of your leg. Yeah. If you don't go to a doctor and have evidence that that happened, there is no way to prove that you had a broken leg. And the sense of urgency too. Get it done right away. Don't wait a couple days because at that point you don't know what's going to happen. I, I had someone come in last week, Andrew. I've seen him a couple times. And it took him about a week and a half to get in because he said, you know what, I felt good. Then all of a sudden things started happening to where I started having headaches three, four days later. And I tried to, again, said, I tried to work it out. It wasn't happening. Now I'm coming in two weeks later. So I go, you know what, that's good, Andrew. You're in here now. But you should have been here within two, three days. Yeah. Not the first, not two weeks later. And a lot of times, if you would have gone in on the first day, you would have had a smaller problem. It could have gone away faster. Because if you start treating right away, 
you're 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 not going to worry about re-injuring yourself. Exactly. Your chiropractor is going to give you a list of things not to do. He's going to say avoid heavy lifting. They go, well, you, you know better than I do, but you're going to yeah. give them a list of things of course, you've seen not to do so they don't make their injuries worse. And if you don't know that, you might have a relatively small injury. Exactly. Try to go back to work too soon or try to do yard work too soon and end up making it worse because you didn't know that there's things you can't do after you're hurt. We talked about earlier too, when you're in an accident, you may not have the right mindset. You might have a concussion. You might just, just not be in it to know what to do. So having a chiropractor, having an attorney to know where to go for the examination and what to do next right away, even if you think it's minor, again, it's what you think is your perception, just give them a call. That's what I'm saying. Just, just give them a call. Hey, I have a quick question for you. I'm just a little fender bender. I'm feeling this. What should I do? For me, I do a free exam, see what's going on. If something happens, if I feel at that point we'll take an x-ray, we'll take an x-ray right there in the office. At that point, you have documentation again. Mm -hmm. There is a condition you can document. So if something else happens, we know what happened at that point from the initial injury, initial accident. Yeah. And a lot of times, when I say that injuries don't reveal themselves until a few days later, sometimes the soreness of the adrenaline has to leave your body for you to feel it. Duh. But sometimes you don't feel it until you do something you shouldn't have done. So you might have gotten, you actually might have, you know, displaced a disc or done some, a minor tear. And a minor tear becomes a major tear when you think you're okay and then go golfing. Mm. Or you think you're okay and then try to lift up your bags of groceries. But you didn't know it was there because you never got the examination. Well, you're in World Cup soccer and then all of a sudden you get an injury and you're out for the game. Yeah. And when we play sports, going back to sports or athletes too, you don't go 10, 15%. You don't got to take 10% off. You're going to go 100%. But I want to see that for my patients. I want them there so they know they're 100%. Yeah. I want them to test it out. At that point, hey, you think you're good? Good. Test it out. We have documentation that you're not okay. Test it out. If you're, if you're worse, great. We'll deal with that. Exactly. And you want to test it out in the conditions of a, a clinic. You don't, want to, exactly. you don't want to find out something's wrong at the gym when you're trying to bench press 200 pounds. Yeah. If, if you have an injury, you want to find out with someone watching you because they'll know at 15 pounds something's going on. And trust, and again, build that trust first before you have an accident with your chiropractor, medical doctor, with your attorney, so you know, okay, this is what I'm going to go to. I trust their opinion. Let them tell me what to do. At that point, after a couple of days, I kind of figure it out on my own, but realize again, you're not in sometimes the right state of mind to make that judgment call about your own body even. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything else to add for our first show? I, I think a lot of it is when I go back to what we just talked about, reflect on it, I want someone prepared. I want, I want a, a list in my head, and you have your cards too, that give you a checklist, understanding what do I have to do when I'm in the moment that reminds me, okay, I ate it, this is it. Because I realize you may not be in the right mind. You have your own rush going. You might be sore. You might, be, you might have kids in the back seat yelling at you mm -hmm. on a hot freeway in the summer. At that point, you have people moving around you. You want to make sure you have that checklist on paper to go through so you do everything right so your overall stress reduces after the accident actually occurs. I would just say, go through the checklist. I try to make it as simple as, as possible. It's very simple. And I would say, whether you're at fault or not, you want to go through those steps. Because if you caused an accident, you want to make sure you go through those steps so that they can't exaggerate their injuries, so they, they can't exaggerate damage. You know, let's say when I, the example of taking photos at the scene of the car. Yes. Let's say you take photos at, at the scene of the accident, they drive off, they get hit a week later by someone who had no insurance. And yeah. I'm sure you see this too. Yeah. They get hit by somebody with no insurance oh my God. and they try to blame all the damage on you. And you can say, oh Wait no, I have photos of your car. You had a little, a little tiny dent. Don't blame me for, this, for your car being totaled. It's important to take photos of both cars. So I'd say, huh. if you caused the accident, go through the four steps. If you were the victim of the accident, go through the four steps. And what was the fifth step again, too? Oh, no, there's, there's only four. four. The fifth what? one I mentioned was just make the sure bonus. you treat. Yeah, the bonus. That's a bonus step. Bonus step. Make sure you treat uh, within, as soon as you start to feel pain, make an appointment, go in for treatment. Because if if it turns out it's not that bad, your, your chiropractor will let you know it's not that bad. Easy. If it turns out you need to start taking it easy, you need to start going in for more treatment, they'll let you know. But you'd rather let it, you'd rather find out at the first sign of pain instead of finding out when you've let things kind of, you know, get out of hand and get worse. Because again, at that point, you're going to have problems that may have been treated in a couple of weeks, may take a couple months, or may have long-term scar tissue that cause arthritis where you may need more permanent care and your whole life changes from it too. So thanks for the first show. We'll talk Thank again. We'll see much. what's going on. I hope again, I'm going to put all of Taylor's information on the show notes. We need the replay too on our YouTube channel. I'm going to put the link to the YouTube channel. Hopefully I'll get it done tonight. Depends on my schedule, but my wife has me do. <laughs> at that point, we'll get it to you and have a good day. Have a great day. Cool.